Hi, is everybody back? Uh, yes, we're, uh, we're ready. Sorry. Yeah. Is that a confirmation? Well, you can see people sitting there, right? <laughs> what about everybody else? I don't know how to see them here. Mm. I don't know if it's possible to see them here while you have the yeah. screen up. Yeah, I think you'd have to stop sharing your content. Which I'm not going to do. <laughs> Probably don't want to have your video. I'm this not going to. Stop it. Six participants. Yeah. Okay. Should I, should I continue? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So we'll restart. Um, so my final uh, item on how earthquake seismology may tell us about uh, fault structure is not just to look at the static picture of a low velocity zone, but also look at how the velocity structure is actually changing with time. And by time, I'm not meaning geological time, but like real time that we can track. So um, it goes back to one of my favorite faults, the Gophar Fault of East Pacific Rise. Um, so this is again, um, this oceanic transform fault. Let's try to highlight here. Oh, it doesn't come out very nicely. So this is the orientation of this transform fault, mid ocean ridges here. And, and what's interesting about this transform fault is that it had had a magnitude six earthquakes in the past um, on two repeating asperities, like I tried to highlight here with these two oval areas. And um, so this has happened in the past for like we have recorded five, six, of the cycles uh, with each earthquake separated by uh, about five to six years. And this was also um, the reason why this um, experiment was planned ahead of time so that the stations were dropped down there uh, before um, the another magnitude six earthquake occurred in 2006. So it's kind of a successful prediction of this event um, but what's also amazing, I mean, a lot of amazing results came out of this experiment, but one of the interesting piece of information is that there was, um, again, I should go back to my color. So what's between this two magnitude six rupture asperities is what we call a barrier zone, meaning that neither of those past cycles of earthquakes were able to penetrate into this barrier zone. So um, what they, they have recorded within this experiment is how much of seismicity has been um, occurring within this barrier zone. So each of those red dot, the yellow dots was actually a, a earthquake or part of the earthquake swarm, but also part of the foreshock sequence between that magnitude six events. And um, what Jeff McGuire had done here is to check how much of velocity, shear wave speed here has changed. So this is change in velocity, delta V over a background velocity in percent. So when we look at a 3% of velocity change, this is, this is really big signal in terms of velocity anomalies. For, for, um, versus time. So what we're seeing here is as a time of 2008, those are days of 2008, and the magnitude six earthquake occurred at the end of the time axis. So we're seeing that there is a big drop in the seismicity structure or in the velocity structure for this barrier zone here just before, a few weeks before the main shock rupture. Now, correspondingly, this, so the velocity is plotted as the red dot, the, the black dots, 
And the blue line here is the number of earthquakes also within this barrier zone. And this means, this peak here means an increase of number of earthquakes. So let's just highlight that. This is an increase of velocity and then decrease of velocity with time. So um, this is interesting. This is basically saying that just a couple of weeks before a man shock event, the fault zone structure is actually changing and change by a large amount where we see 3%, as big as 3% of shear wave speed increase. Um, drop, increase here. Now we don't really have a good explanation of or quantitative explanation of what might have contributed to the 3% drop in shear wave speed. There are speculations, for example, the kind of mechanism I just talked about, a porosity change. And because the time period here also corresponds to activity in four shocks, so that's basically this big band here, is activity of four shocks that maybe some of the four shocks has been rupturing this barrier zone. Those are very small earthquakes for shocks. They've been rupturing this barrier zone and create open space that would allow temporarily to increase the porosity of this barrier zone, which results in the temporal dip in velocity structure. So um, that's just one of the speculations um, being raised for explaining the temporal changes in velocity structure. Um, we can also look at velocity change with time corresponding to the power seismic healing phase. So we we'll always talk about that when you have an earthquake rupture and afterward the fault will try to heal, regain strength towards the next um, rupture. So this event or this plot basically try to um, show a lot of information. First of all, at the bottom here is the rate of seismicity um, surrounding the magnitude 6 Parkfield earthquake. So that was in 2004. And on top of that is the relative velocity change for the same period. Now, if you look at this scale here, this scale is a percent of 0 0.08. So almost just 0.1% of velocity change. And this is what I said that in the previous case for GOFAR, 3% of velocity change is a really, really prominent signal. But even here, we're seeing that after this 2004 magnitude 6 earthquake, we see the velocity. Well, first of all, we have a jump in this velocity structure, very small in terms of amplitude, but on this relative scale is a big jump. And this is interpolated because of the cold seismic rupture, again, open up space to allow for, um, um, for, for motion and then change of the material properties across the fall zone. And then afterward, you're having this healing phase, this healing phase that is nicely correlated with, so the red line Okay, I'm going to erase my red line here. The original red line on this plot here is a displacement at a GPS station. Okay. So this is nicely showing that this displacement, the power seismic displacement, at least is capturing the trend of velocity structure change for, well, this is almost three years of period following that man shock event. So in a way that seismology is able to not only capture the 3D velocity structure that can tell us where there's some kind of weakened fault zones, there is a highly damaged fault zones in 3D, but we can also, if you have really dense network, you can also try to catch whether the velocities are changing with time, and especially those velocity changes 
associated with earthquakes because I think eventually we'll all try to try to answer the question is are the earthquakes predictable? If they're predictable, what are the signals we should be looking for? So 3D size, I mean, 4D seismology is really you know, the big um, direction in my opinion. All right, so um, I'm just going to move to my next topic here is we're done with seismology. Well, I've just basically picked a few points from seismology that how it could be used to understand fault behavior. Um, the next I'm trying to say a few words about um, how earthquake geodesy can also help us to understand the deformation of the fault. So um, there are lots of uh, geodetic measurements that we could talk about but I think probably we're going to rely on GPS and INSAR for earthquake type of deformation. Um, and we'll probably touch a bit on the other types like cream meters um, at the end. So I think everybody is familiar with the idea of GPS. It's try to, um, well, basically using the group of satellites to track down the relative motion between two points on the surface of the earth. Um, the, I guess the, the real difference that makes earthquake geodesy at very high precision, so high precision in terms of we're getting down to millimeter scale resolution compared to what you have on the GPS on your car or on your phone is that we're relying on the phase change difference um, instead of just travel time. So by tracking the phase differences of the radio waves um, between the satellite and the point on the surface. So the point on the surface has to have an antenna receiver in order to transmit the signals. So I'm not going to kind of get to the technical details here, um, but we'll show uh, the actual data coming out from GPS um, networks. The other type of um, geodetic observation is called INSAR, uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar Interferometry. That's probably less familiar compared to GPS, but it's also very commonly used um, in earthquake geology. And the idea is very similar in terms of using the phase difference of the radio waves transmitted from the satellite to the surface reflection point. Now, the only difference here, I shouldn't say the only difference, but the major difference here is that for INSAR, you don't really need a receiver on the ground to reflect the signal like GPS would require. So basically you can just have the satellite flying over this interesting area over and over again. And you're going to try to calculate what's the surface deformation during the period of the two flybys. Now, um, the idea is very similar to, I think you probably have seen this kind of diagram before. So this is a single slit diffraction diagram. And basically it's telling you that the phase difference or the phase interval between the neighboring zeros from those ref refracted, diffracted waves would be calculated based on what's the wavelength of your signal and what's the width of the slit here, D. Now we can apply the same idea to the radar signal, signal is that because the radar is singing at hundreds of kilometers on top of the surface and the radar itself, the satellite itself has a certain length of the antenna. So that antenna, and uh, <clears throat> let's try to, I don't know how to draw that here. See, this is a distance R is the distance from the satellite to the surface. And here is um, X is the kind of surface resolution we're trying to see. Then the idea of this phase different or phase interval can be applied as if we're looking at the lambda over D is your X over R, which is a very small number, by the way. So um, 
Basically, you can try to plug in your numbers. For example, you know what's the radar wavelength, that's tens of centimeters. And you also know the length of the antenna, which is a few meters. And we also know the orbit, um, the height of the orbit of satellite, hundreds of kilometers. So we can plug them in into this basic resolution formula. And we can find out that the surface resolution of X is on the order of, um, well, you can try to do the calculation, but it's going to be on the order of meters or even tens of meters, I think, uh, kilometers. Maybe I should do it here. Um, 10 centimeter. Sorry, I should have done this beforehand. Um, what is my... Uh, yeah, the slit is, let's say, 10 meters. Yeah, I'll just do it here. So this is lambda here. This is D. This is R. Did I get it right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I should have 10 centimeter over, let's say, the antenna is 10 meter. And I um, need to have my, uh, so I should have 100, say 100 kilometer at the bottom here and topography resolution. So I can do that. I guess X will be one, yeah, will be one kilometer. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so this gives me a, a topography resolution of one kilometer if I'm just going to rely on the length of antenna. But the trick here is that you don't have to just rely on this length of the antenna itself. You can allow the, the satellite to be flying over some distance. So in the end that you could have a satellite at the position of A1 and at the position of A2 at a different time, and I use the difference between this A1 and A2, that's a vector we call it the baseline vector. And this baseline vector can be as big as a few kilometers. So you're basically creating artificially lot much longer length of the antenna so that you can reduce your um, resolution down to tens of meters. That's, that's really the trick of INSAR is to get to the baseline vector um, work for, for the observation. But in the end, um, everything else is similar that you can calculate the phase difference if you have the radar signal be reflected from the Earth's surface and then be recorded at these two positions of the antenna, A1 and A2. And that phase difference is going to be proportional to four pi over the wavelength of the radar and the distance or the difference between the distance from the surface point to the A1, A2 points. And you can also calculate what will be the height of the antenna to the surface of the Earth. So that's actually one way of use in planetary science, try to image the topography of Earth and other planets. But in earthquake application, we are going to need at least two of those interferometries. So this is one of the interfer one interferometry. We're going to need another interferometry where the earthquake comes, or the, the satellite comes back and look down at the same direction toward the Earth's surface. And if the Earth's surface, for some reason, this is the original position of the surface. And for some reason that the surface has decided to change by a vector of D here, then the two flybys, if you take the difference between the two interferometries, they should give you information of how much is that displaced vector D. But, sorry, this should be a dot product between 
the actual displacement vector of your surface and the direction of the satellite or light of sight. So this one delta rho tells you how much of surface has deformed in the direction of the satellite so that we can try to combine this information with another observation where if this information is from a ascending satellite and another is from a descending satellite, we can try to combine them that we can get independent information of what is the actual displacement vector D. So that's the idea of um, INSAR. And then picturally, you can look at that, like for example, this INSAR satellite is trying to image the uh, volcano area where it flies by, and this is kind of the swath, the, the lens of the swath. And basically you're looking at is the INSARs are going to produce this so-called interferometric images where they are just different fringes of colors going from red to blue representing the phase differentials. For example, if I'm looking at a pixel right here, pixel A, that's been reflected on the phase diagram as this color here, and another pixel here, which is closer to the summit of the volcano, and it's going to be reflected on the phase diagram by another color here. So by counting the difference between those two phases, let's see, by counting this difference between the two phases, for example here, this is roughly one and a half wavelength difference. And I know the wavelength of the radar wave that I'm using is 2.8 centimeters. So 1.5 times 2.8 gives me a displacement of 4.2 centimeters. And this is saying that my pixel A on the ground has moved 4.2 centimeters in the direction of the light of sight for the period of the two flybys with respect to my pixel B. And that's also, again, always relative motion between the two points. So the whole idea of INSAR is to get those interferometric fringes and count how many cycles you are looking at from one pixel to another pixel, and then couple that with the, um, the wavelength of the radar wave, try to get the actual um, deformation. So this is another example um, that I took, I think from a USGS webpage, where we have this um, inflation of volcano in Alaska. And um, the wavelength here, I think it's also 2.8 centimeters of the radar wave. And basically what you can do is I mean, a very simplified treatment of this kind of fringe images is to count how many cycles you have from the center to deformation to the flanks of the volcano. Um, for example, here I've counted six fringes and then time that by 3.8, you get roughly um, 17 centimeters of uplift of this point, which is back to the point downhill. Um, and then with that kind of information, you can try to model is how much of magma might be rising up here to cause this kind of deformation. Um, so that's all possible with, um, I think Coulomb also has a function of doing volcanic deformation, so we might come to that too. But that's a basic idea of INSAR. Um, so compared to GPS, See, we, we get this kind of uh, two different types of geodetic, geodetic observations where GPS is point specific. So you have to put a receiver on the ground in order to get those high precision um, signals. But GPS can give us resolution down to millimeters. And it gives, gives us resolution in time as well because you can set, for example, the GPS can be very high frequency. You can have one data point per second 
one hertz of GPS, and they can almost be used to record co-seismic deformation. So GPS gives site-specific um, temporal resolution, very good temporal resolution um, recordings. But the limitation would be that, well, it has to be site-specific. It means that if you want to cover a big area, you have to spread it a lot of GPS stations across the fault zones, and hopefully very far away from the fault zones, you can capture the whole fault zone deformation. So that's not very realistic, at least currently. And that's the an advantage of INSAR, is that for INSAR, you don't need any kind of surface receivers. And it can cover a very broad area, but at the expense that the resolution is not as high as GPS, and temporarily, that you have to rely on the cycle of the satellite. So it could be that for earthquake studies, because earthquakes occur at very short time period, and if your satellite is only coming back another two weeks later, then what you're seeing in this two weeks period will be having your co-seismic plus post-seismic after sleep deformation. That's impossible to decouple those deformation if you rely on INSAR only. So that's, uh, right, so I'm not going to get into this, um, but what I really, uh, I guess what the next on the, uh, what I prepare here is to, now we have this kind of GPS observation. Let's say we have very good GPS and insert coverage of the fault zones that we're interested in, and we see this amount of displacement on the surface. Now, how can we go from there to infer how much of that surface deformation comes from how much of fault slip and how that fault slip is distributed across this um, entire fault area? So for that, we can have uh, analytical solutions we can rely on partially, um, if we're treating them as a simple question, we can partially rely on these analytical solutions and I think Laurent has already touched upon that um, the definitions for edge and screw dislocation. So we're not going to um, get to the details, but really that the difference here is that in this application is that we can use edge dislocation to present a dip slip where the shear motion is um, normal to the dislocation line or the propagation of the slip of the rupture is at the same direction as fault displacement. While the other type of dislocation, the screw dislocation on this right side here, where the dislocation line is parallel to the shear motion, but the propagation of rupture, of earthquake rupture, is perpendicular to the shear, the shear motion here. So this is a case where we can apply it for a strike slip fault. Right? For a strike slip fault, your rupture is propagating along the dip direction, but your slip is in the strike direction. Um, right, so we can have simple analytical solutions for a strike slip fault. For example, if I have a strike slip fault that extending from the surface to a depth of W here, that's the depth of W. And if this fault is infinitely long along the strike direction, then the simple analytical solution of surface di displacement for this, well, for this type of uh, uniform slip on the fault can be represented by an arctangent function, like the shape that we have seen already many times from that elastic rebound model, um, probably also from um, co-seismic GPS models. But the idea is that if you plot up this simple analytical solution, where on this left side is surface displacement normalized by slip on the fault. So D is slip on the fault or fault slip. And we're assuming it's a uniform, two meters, three meters across this entire fault. And W is the fault width. 
So your normalized displacement can be represented by a constant plus or minus half depends on which side of the fault zone you're at, minus this arctangent function, which is, well, the only variable here is distance away from the fault. Okay, so this is y direction. This distance across the fault, but also normalized by the fault width. So if I'm making a plot here on this side, where, okay, I'm just going to do it here. If I make a plot of u over d versus y over w, and this is basically your arctangent function, where it goes to half here and goes to minus half there. Now, this uniform shape of this arctangent function is telling me that if the fault extends further down dip versus, for example, let's actually I have a few cases here. If the fault width is five kilometers versus the fault width is 35 kilometers, on the actual distance scale, I will have a very gradual decay in the displacement for the 35 kilometer case versus uh, five kilometer case. So the shape of the decay, displacement decay away from the fault can tell us something about the down dip limit or the, the width of the fault slip. And again, so everything here is coupled or normalized by your slip D and the width of the fault. Um, so that means that you can't really rely on this, just on this data, you can really get independent estimate of D and W. But that's, um, let's see how that. Now the, the another case here, a more realistic case, is that instead of allow the fault to run infinitely along, along the strike, because each earthquake has to start somewhere and stop somewhere. So we're going to have the fault of finite length along the strike. So this is, say, another strike tip fault of finite width. And the displacement field now looks differently from the previous case. In the previous case, we only have displacement in this x direction. So everything is just shear only. There is no fault normal direction displacement. But when it comes to the finite length fault, if you just look at a profile sort of cut into the center of the fault, along this profile, motion is still primarily, so I'm not drawing that to scale. So along this profile, the motion is still primarily shear. But as you move closer to the edges, you're still, you're starting to have false normal displacement. And this is just the edge effect of having a dislocation started somewhere and ended somewhere instead of allowing it to run infinitely long. So on the, at the bottom here, if we plot up again this profile, like I draw in this red line here, and displacement as a function of distance away from the fault, distance away from the fault, but normalized by the width of the fault, and you can see that they pretty much still follow that arctangent shape of decay with distance, except that this decay curve will be dependent on your ratio between the length of the fault and the width of the fault. Now, um, this seems to be interesting information because if we can actually identify which of the lines that the displacement is following, 
we can potentially get information of the ratio of R over W. But in reality is that they're so closely spaced. Like if we go from 2.5 to 5 and to infinity, they're very closely in spaced so that your, even your GPS station, your GPS records are sort of just within this range, error range, that you can't really rely on this type of shape to um, get a precise information of R over W. Okay, um, yes, so that's the finite width of fault. And uh, another example is here is that instead of having the fault run all the way to the surface, like surface cutting fault, in some cases the fault is buried from, say, a depth of little w. So I use little w here to a depth of big w. So for this kind of case, because of that fault is buried, so all those high frequency or short wavelength signals will decay very fast with distance. It does not express itself directly on the surface. So we're going to have very smooth and lower amplitude of those surface breaking faults. And in the end, this displacement look like this kind of shape for that w, um, little w and big w um, values, which is interesting because now you have exactly on the fault, there is zero displacement because the surface does not break, but you have a maximum slip at some distance away from the fault itself. And this can be calculated to be proportional to the mean depth so the mean depth is a square root of little w and big w. Again, if you have a bare default, and if your w, or this two depths, your upper end and lower end of the fault is well separated, we can try to rely on the shape of the surface displacement distribution and get some sense of what's the average depth of the fault. And uh, let's see if I have anything here. So those are just the basic analytical solutions for, um, for having a uniform slip on the strike safe fault. And we can look at um, real case examples. Uh, for example, we're having, um, this was actually a very old earthquake from um, Japan. It was a strike sip earthquake, and those vectors came from um, triangulation because this was pre-GPS constellation period. Um, but they very nicely show that the fault is roughly here. So you see this northwest moving on this um, east side of the fault and the sort of southeast moving on the west side of the fault. And if we plot them up on the diagram like we see before from the analytical solutions, this is a horizontal displacement with real units of meters. And this is distance, the x-axis is distance from the fault. And they have been flipped signs. So this used to be, if you plot them in the actual sign was sitting on the lower quadrant. But that looks very, very similar. Actually it can be very well fit by the analytical solution from the previous page. Um, and then you have similar observations from another strike ship earthquake. Um, I guess, uh, Laurent, what should I do? It's 3.30. Should I stop now and then go to the lab tutorial? Um, I, I would yeah. suspect so. I mean, we, uh, we have I, sort of, I think I, I already uh, gone through enough materials that the student can start on the lab. Do you want to introduce what the lab is and what they have to do for the lab, maybe? 
Yeah, I, I prepared a tutorial for that, but I was just wondering, should I stop now to switch topic to that and then I'll come back to this material next Monday? Then. I, th I think that might be good so that we can start the lab tomorrow uh, here uh, and, and have the basics for uh, what we need to go, uh, what we need to know to move forward. And then that may actually prompt questions that right. will steer the lecture material next week. Okay. All right. So, um, so I'm going to stop here. Um, let's see what I want to do. I think I will have to slip, switch to my laptop, which has my lab on it, um, to demonstrate the tutorial. So I'm going to stop share here. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So, um, I well, Laurent has put the lab on the on queue that you guys can go download. Um, so this is, a, this is a lab using the Coulomb software and try to calculate if we have certain distribution of slab on the fault. Um, this is your source fault. And then how much of surface dis displacement and how much of uh, stress changes we're going to have for any kind of recipient fault, receiver fault. Um, I know that for the McGill students and Queen students that the software has already been downloaded, but what about for others? Like, <coughs> do we all have MATLAB running from either personal laptops or uh, university commuters? That yes, we do. Okay. All right. So, um, so then MATLAB is not a problem. Right, so what Coulomb does is, um, like I dis just described, to calculate the static displacement. And from displacement, you can get strains, stresses, and all sorts of um, information that you would like to have from earthquake slip or mag magmatic intrusion or dike expansion. But the limitation here is because it follows the analytical solution from Okada, um, 1992, and then there was another paper before it. So it, the medium 
has to be an elastic half space uh, with uniform isotropic properties. Basically, it means that you're down to two independent elastic moduli, uh, being shear modulus or Poisson's ratio or other um, combinations of two um, moduli. So that's, that's definitely one of the limitations of a Coulomb if you are seeking of calculating stresses or displacement for a spatially heterogeneous medium, then um, you should try other, um, there are other softwares out there for those kind of purposes. But Coulomb is great for um, teaching purposes, but also for research purpose is to illustrate the basic idea of stress triggering is when we have displacement at one location, how it's going to change the stress field of other locations. And for our interest of earthquake studies is how that stress perturbation might be triggering seismicity. So, um, right, that's, that's basically the foundation of Coulomb software. So what the software does is to, well, what it did was to go into these two papers, two seminal papers by uh, Okadazo where he has presented all the equations, analytical solutions by having uh, shear or tensile faults in half space to calculate the surface deformation and internal deformation. It's currently, when I put these figures together, it was fun to look at this because this was a paper that he published in 1985. And this was a following up paper in 1992 and you can basically see that the only difference in title is changed from surface to internal. And there is not much change in the abstract either. The abstract is slightly rewritten to reflect that now we're not only looking at surface deformation, but basically deformation anywhere in the medium. So that's the foundation of Coulomb software. Um, to get, well, before you get started um, on Coulomb, um, should really go to the user guide, which is also um, can be downloaded from the USGS webpage, is that the sign conventions for resolving stress and for focal mechanisms um, of the types of faults defined in Coulomb. So there are two types of faults defined in Coulomb. One is a source fault. So source fault is where you will define a non-zero slip. And the second type of fault is a recipient fault or receiver fault, they call. Receiver fault can have its own orientation. So defined by the strike, the dip, and the rake angle. But the recipient fault has no slip. So recipient fault has zero slip on it. And source fault has non-zero slip. And in the end, in the Coulomb input file, that's the only distinction that you can use to tell whether this fault or this segment of the fault is a source or is a receiver fault. Um, and those are just the sign conventions for defining orientations of geometry of the fault. Uh, for example, zero rake would be left lateral, uh, right lateral would be 180 and then reverse slip versus normal slip. And um, dip angle is always positive. And um, the sign convention for strain and stress in Coulomb follows the engineering convention. So meaning dilation is positive and compression is negative. So those are just things that you should keep in mind when you try to interpolate your, um, your numbers. And the um, idea of calculating the Coulomb stress is to resolve the stress, um, so stress change in shear stress change and normal stress change. Um, in Coulomb, it does not directly calculate pore pressure change, so we just put it here, and then combine them into the Coulomb stress concept and look at whether this Coulomb stress change, when it's resolved on your optimal uh, recipient fault, is going to promote or inhibit the slip. Um, basically, if we're looking at a positive Coulomb stress values, then um, 
triggering is indicated and versus if we look at a negative Coulomb stress value, then the, um, we call it a stress shadow. So that's the um, idea of Coulomb stress. And then in the, in the, in the lab handout, I have, um, so maybe I should just go to the lab handout here. Um, right. So in the handout, I basically divided into a couple of sections. The first section is a tutorial example with a left lateral strexive fault. Now um, you can follow the instructions here to load up the Coulomb software and reading in from the um, provided input files that comes within the software. For example, here, if you're reading this strike fault input profile um, and then ask it to plot it up, they're going to show up in Coulomb as strike fault with left lateral motion. Um, let's uh, see if I can. Try to go down this. Um, maybe I'll just uh, stop Coulomb on my soft on my computer. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Yeah, so when you type Coulomb in my lab, um, in your working directory of Coulomb, it's going to show up some window here with blank, but then you need to read in your input profile. Uh, for example, I'm reading in this strike zip fault. Where should it go? So it's first going to show up in a map view but you can change your view by going to 3D view here. And then, um, well, so that shows up in 3D, which is nice. Um, another way that um, you can try to modify this profile is go to this window. This window gives you all the input parameters. For example, you can define where you want the fault to be. Like, so Sorry, in this section here, you can define where your study area, so that's your beginning of the X and Y axis, the end of the X and Y axis, and how big you want a grid to be, is two kilometers or one kilometers. And then your fault can also be defined to be starting from a point, ending at another point, X, Y, and with this break, net slip, three meters, DP angle of 90 degrees, and then it goes from five kilometers to 15 kilometers. So those are parameters that you can go in to change if this is a simple uh, one single fault model. And then, um, oh, I forgot to say here, you can also went in here to change those elastic moduli. For example, here, we defined Poisson's ratio and Young's modulus. So you can change them to the um, to parameters that you think is reasonable for your study area. And you can calculate it to be, um, for the calculation to be done at 7.5 kilometers or you want it to be surface displacement, then you would change it to zero kilometers. And this is your friction coefficient. You, choose to be 0 0.4 or 0 0.8. So there is a range of friction co coefficients could be uh, reasonable. So that's the basic input of Coulomb. And once you're happy with your input parameters, you can go ahead to calculate, for example, what's the surface displacement. 
Now, this calculation is going to depend on how fine your grid is. Um, if you're using, for example, I use two kilometers, but if you use half kilometer, of course, it's going to take much longer time. But this is basically what the displacement would look like, horizontal displacement looks like at a depth of 7.5 kilometer. Now, um, it doesn't very make sense if we're, I mean, we don't really have GPS stations at 7.5 kilometers, right? So most of the time we try to make the calculation on the surface so that we can directly compare to GPS observations. Um, and then you can prob probably already see the difference from the previous case is that now um, the near fault displacement is almost zero because we're looking at a buried fault that goes from five to 15 kilometers instead of expanding all the way to the surface. Okay. So that's the um, surface displacement option. And then you can also go to other types of options here, calculating the strain, the stress. So stress, you can decompose that into shear stress, normal stress, and Coulomb stress changes. Um, when you calculate Coulomb stress change, it's important to define where you want your receiver fault to be. So in this case here, we define the receiver fault is 41 degree strike, 90 degrees in, um, in deep angle, and the rake is also zero degrees. So this is exactly the same as our source fault. So if I click calculate here, this is going to give me what would be the stress change on the fault itself after the fault had three meters of slip from five to 15 kilometers. Um, so depth is zero, which is fine. Right, so this is basically showing that we're having, um, so because I'm looking at the surface, And this is uh, on top of the fault. So that's why I'm seeing stress actually increased at the surface exactly or in the vicinity of the fault itself. But if I change it to somewhere within the fault zone depth, 7.5 kilometers, we should see what we expect to be stress drop on the fault. And then if you change the depth to 20 kilometers, you're going to see a different pattern. Because again, this moves away from the fault zone, I mean, from the depth, of, depth range of the fault. So this is a kind of um, concept of Coulomb is to calculate stress changes in this whole medium for your defined receiver fault. If, for example, if I'm just looking at this map that's on my screen right now, I'm showing a stress shadow surrounding the fault. And then at the top of the fault, ahead of the fault, and then at the bottom of the fault here at the, the other tip, we're having stress increases. And if I were able to put on some seismicity on it, you will probably see that those are the areas that seismicity is being promoted while within this area they are being inhibited. I mean, if the if Coulomb stress triggering is the dominant mechanism for generating seismicity uh, around the fault area. Um, right, so let's see. I'm now interested, instead of being the fault, the source fault itself, I want to look at another fault, let's see, of right lateral slip motion. Now I'll probably want to put it at different location, but I don't get the option to um, change here. But if I just change the motion on the fault, on the receiver fault, okay. So the source fault still has all those input parameters from the first, the beginning, um, the window at the beginning. But what I've changed here is to look at for a left lateral strike slip source fault, 
what would the stress change it has on another fault of right lateral motion. And this is showing that if there is, and this is not real case, but if there was another fault exactly at the same location at the source fault, but with a right lateral motion, as if that for some sense that the fault uh, decided to change its own motion from left to lateral to left to lateral, uh, from left to lateral to right lateral, then the fault will be actually promoted to continue to have higher seismicity. So this is actually a, a good comparison between uh, the previous slide, previous figure and this figure to show that how sensitive the results are depending on where you put the receiver fault and what's the orientation of the receiver fault and what's the sense of motion on the receiver fault. Okay, so always when you try to present Coulomb stress calculation results, always clearly state what is the receiver fault and how the stress is being resolved on it. Mm. Let's go back to my tutorial here. I think I covered the first part of the tutorial. Um, right, so there are other options. You can try to draw depth cross sections. For example, if you're interested in this profile across the fault, you can draw a line and they're going to show up in the steps cross-sectional view where you see that uh, for this fault going from five to 15 kilometers, there is this big stress shadow. And then on top of that, and at the bottom of that, there's stress increase. Now, the second part of the tutorial is to, instead of using this very simple fault model with uniform slab, let's try to load up a more realistic model where the slip is being distributed over, um, I don't remember how many, oh, oh, 40, 40 sub faults. And each of the sub faults will have its own different um, slip value on it to represent the 1992 Landers earthquake. So um, for that, that's also an example provided by the Coulomb software. So you can just go into the input profile and uh, look for where's Landers. Oh, here, Landers variable slip. So this is plotting up in latitude, longitude um, coordinates already. I'm not sure if I can see that in 3D. No, I can't. Um, yeah, so the, in the input file, you have to define um, your x, y, and then what does x, y correspond to latitude, longitude, if you want to make the conversion between latitude and x, y, which is not down here. But um, I guess you can still try to calculate the displacement and Coulomb stress on the fault. Uh, is that? Okay, so um, yeah, so what's being set up here is to calculate the Coulomb stress change on the fault again for a left for a right lateral motion at 7.5 kilometers. Uh, I don't even know if that's the right choice of depth. Let's try to do that. Okay, so this is how it looks like um, at 7.5 kilometers of Coulomb stress change in the surrounding area of the Landers fault um, because of that man shock itself. Now, um, cosmetic thing you can do is instead of having the tilt, you can make it interpolated so that it looks smooth on the, um, on the map view, while the previous one is like a kind of grid view of um, the individual grid. So um, if you compare this to, let's see, where do I have it? 
this map is pretty much what you see from the cover page of that Coulomb user guide. That theirs looks fancier. Um, theirs also have this big bear earthquake to this left corner here where we don't have that. But that's essentially the same map showing up there where we have seismicity. Um, being located within this Coulomb stress increase zone and then large part of the stress shadow area has very few activity in it. So that's, uh, where was I? Yeah, okay. Right, so I just took a few examples from um, King et al. 1995 to show the concept of right lateral strike fault Coulomb stress change. But I think we don't have to go through that now since we have just gone through that real example with uh, real software. Um, another thing is that within Coulomb, you can also specify your original stress orientation. Okay. So for example, if you know, let's say I'm interested in earthquakes in Fox Creek, where I have a, a good idea of what's original stress, um, the compression is roughly um, from northeast towards southwest. So you can put that information into the Coulomb stress calculation software and let it to calculate under this kind of regional stress value, what would be the optimal failure plan. So that's the alternative way of defining your receiver fault. Right. So for example, if I have an earthquake, and then you know where your receiver fault is, and you know what is orientation, what is its sense of motion, you can go directly into software and write in the input parameters for your receiver fault. But if, for example, um, again, I go back to Fox Creek area that I don't really have a good idea what are the faults. So there's no surface expression of faults, there's no mapped fault in that area. Now what I will do is I'm going to take this source fault, source earthquake rupture model, and I'm going to input the regional stress orientation and ask a Coulomb to calculate, given this regional stress orientation, what are the optimal failure plans? And what are the orientations that are most likely to be triggered where the Coulomb stress is maximum or Coulomb stress change is maximum? So that's another way of um, using Coulomb for um, stress calculations. And um, you have seen this before. No, you haven't seen this before. Okay. So those are different uh, earthquakes, but roughly in the same area. This is from 1979 Homestead Valley earthquake. This was 1992 Joshua Tree earthquake. And the reason I'm putting them together is that when we put this four earthquakes, so four earthquakes with magnitude greater than five, and they're all within the vicinity of the lander's fault. So lander's rupture was somewhere here. Lander's epicenter started here and ruptured toward the north. But this Coulomb stress change has nothing to do with the lander's main shock itself. Those are the stress changes because we had this four events four events with magnitude five before the lander's earthquake and how the occurrence of this four events and how they have perturbed the stress field for lenders so that this lenders strike is nearly optimally oriented for failure. And um, Again, so this is the lander sequence itself that started with the Joshua Tree earthquake toward, this was two months ago to the south, and then the main rupture itself. Um, and on the same day, three hours later, there was the Big Bear earthquake toward the um, southwest corner. Right, um, I think this is my last slide uh, in terms of Coulomb stress change is Coulomb stress calculates um, static stress changes, meaning that you always put in into the software some kind of finite slip distribution. 
where you get from, um, so I explained in the lab description where you can find those finite sieve distributions. But um, another type of Coulomb stress change that we don't really calculate or use the Coulomb software to calculate is dynamic stress change. Right. So um, when you have, let's say this is distance, this kind of a synthetic Coulomb stress changes when you have stations moving further and further away from the source, the earthquake, and this time axis is in seconds. So before you reach your static Coulomb stress change, which is static, that's a final level of Coulomb stress change, where it's this amplitude here and this smaller amplitude here versus a negative small amplitude here versus almost zero when you move further away. So static stress change decays very fast with distance. But before we reach the static stress change, there is actually a period of very dynamic or very active dynamic stress change associated with the propagation of seismic wave itself. So we can have very large peaks of Coulomb stress change dynamically, even though the static Coulomb stress change could be very small. So that's just another, I mean, even though we're not using the software to calculate those kind of dynamic stress changes, but I would bring it to attention that we should not forget that dynamic stress triggering could also be very effective especially when we go to very long distances where seeing earthquakes being triggered um, over a thousand kilometers away by those, um, by those passing surface waves, for example. Um, so I'm not going to touch too much on that because I think Catherine were probably going to give us a mini lecture on that too. Um, right, so that's the end of my tutorial. Any questions so far? I don't know what, uh, how we're going to set up the lab, but um, I told Zoe, who is the TA for the Queens um, class, that <coughs> I will be available on Skype if there is um, any question from the class um, tomorrow. Yes, that's that. I think that's how we're going to work. We're meeting in the ESO lab for the people at Queens, where we have uh, the computers all loaded up, ready to go with the uh, Coulomb MATLAB. And uh, before that, read the lab handout and uh, get ready for this. In the meantime, Yajing, uh, Zoe, and I have a couple questions for you but more on the mechanics of the lab that I'll email to you right after lecture. And uh, other than that, do anyone here have any questions pertaining to today's lecture or the lab material? Or Simon Fraser for that matter, or UFT. You guys have been pretty silent. Oh, thumbs up from Vancouver. Thumbs up from Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would say, Yajing, just, uh, you, you might very well receive a lot of uh, written questions very soon once uh, people decant from all the material. Sure, I'll get ready for that, yeah. Um, and then, when is the lab due? Uh, the, the lab is due, uh, so there's two weeks to work on. So. Okay, so yeah, two weeks. So it's right after that. reading. Thanks. Yeah. Well, they on the lab handout. Uh, the actual handout. Uh, the the date is marked on the on the syllabus. So uh, that would be the week after reading week, I think. So, let Let me confirm that. I don't. I don't have the syllabus in front of me right now. So. Huh? Uh, I'm sorry.